Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, Episode 602. Possible Early Complaints After the Initial Testosterone Pellet Insertion. Part 2. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about anti aging medicine. Your host is Dr. Kathy Moffat, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging. Dr. Maupin is the author of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the award-winning book for men that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of testosterone replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. Today we are going to complete our lecture of last week when we talked about the early side effects or complaints our patients have in the first four months after having their first testosterone pellet. And we're talking about women here. So today we are going to um, complete the list of issues you have to consider when you're looking at doing testosterone pellets or having them placed and that is the side effects that can occur after that first four months that uh, might end up being an issue that you have to take a medication for or change your lifestyle for a little bit. So things that we may have to um, adjust for how your body responds to testosterone. So uh, I think knowing these things ahead of time and um, are, is reassuring because if you don't have any of them, you're, you feel great because you got all the benefits of testosterone, but you didn't have any of the side effects or issues. But if you have some of them and you know that this is a common issue and that there are ways uh, to counteract this pro these problems, then you should feel more confident about trying the testosterone pellets because pellets can change your life. They can make your life after menopause or even after 40 a whole different life than you had planned when you were tired without sex drive, with, without motivation to do anything because you didn't have any testosterone. So you should consider the good part of testosterone pellets along with some of the things that can happen. So the four things that we're going to discuss today are facial hair and acne, um, hair loss that has to do only with testosterone, which is androgenic hair loss. It has a certain pattern that I'll show you. Uh, possible lowering of the voice, which is rare, and uh, and weight gain. So we will go over all of these and the um, interventions that we have for those. The um, so first, I'd like to talk about facial hair and acne and um, hair loss in terms of prevention. So when our patients come come to us, uh, we actually place them on a medication that is very low risk. It's a, it was meant to be a diuretic. It's called spironolactone or aldactone. And um, it is not that great at being a diuretic, but it is great at preventing facial hair, preventing acne in women, and preventing hair loss in women. So we start them on that at the beginning of the treatment with testosterone so that patients don't even get these problems. Now, there's some patients that can't take it. Those patients we have to deal with differently. And there are others who, even though they take the, the necessary dose, their genetics is such that they still might get acne or facial hair or uh, thinning hair uh, on their, in a certain pattern. Uh, so we have to deal with that. The initial treatment of spironolactone is 100 milligrams. Then if we still have any of these problems, we use saw palmetto because it is an over-the-counter uh, herb supplement that you can take and it will um, counteract DHT, dihydrotestosterone, a byproduct of testosterone that can cause facial hair acne and hair loss. So those two things are our primary, are our primary treatments. Um, for topical solutions for facial hair, um, or even uh, acne, we can use a topical estrogen and estradiol and estriol. Uh, estriol is a very uh, weak estrogen, but it works great with skin and counteracting the effects of testosterone when it comes to facial hair and acne. So we can use that. 
We also can decrease the next pellet dose of testosterone. And if a patient is taking estrogen, we can al also increase uh, the estrogen dose because estrogen counteracts testosterone uh, systemically as well as it does topically. Um, many times patients come to us who already have facial hair. So when we put, the, put a patient on spironolactone and or saw palmetto or both, uh, we are preventing the future hair growth, facial hair growth, uh, but we, ha we have to take care of the hair growth that's already there because some people get hair growth from their adrenal making some androgens, not testosterone, but different kinds of androgens that can give them facial hair. For, for me, it is very common in my family for women who, uh, on my Italian side of my family, to have facial hair. I mean, it's kind of like my big fat Greek wedding, if you can remember that, where they all came out bleaching their facial hair. Um, but it's better to remove the facial hair if you have it so that when you are on the spironolactone or uh, saw palmetto, it won't grow back. So some of the ways that you can remove facial hair without getting stubble. So I would recommend you don't use a razor because razor is going to give you stubble and women, when you're kissing a woman, even if you're cheek kissing, you don't want to feel stubble. It just isn't very feminine. So one of the things you can use that's the, probably the cheapest is using an epilator. An epilator is a little battery-operated oper device. It looks like you're shaving, but you're actually pulling hairs. Um, and it, what it does is it makes it easier for those of you who have, have to wear bifocals or have co wear contacts and don't have them in when you're getting dressed or don't have them on when you're trying to do your makeup. So this is, you can just run it over the area where you know you have facial hair and it will pull the hair out. So an epilator is something that you can get at the uh, drugstore or you can get online. Um, Amazon carries them and they're relatively cheap. They work for a long time, they take batteries and even if you just have like one facial hair that comes out later or one that you just want to get rid of, you can just run this over it and it'll pull it. So that that's the easiest thing to do if you don't have uh, close close vision anymore, if, you, if you're over 40 and you have to wear bifocals. This helps you get rid of those hairs. Now, of course, waxing is an option. Waxing you can get done at a spa where they um, use a wax and fabric to just pull all of the hairs out. That's a quick way of doing it. Uh, it's probably more, uh, more appropriate for people who have a lot of facial hair. Um, you can pluck one hair at a time with tweezers. Uh, there are um, creams, depilatory creams, which like we used to, there was something called NEAT, I don't know if that still exists, but you can use some of these creams to get rid of facial hair or any kind of body hair. Uh, dermaplaning, is something that we use at the spa, and it, they, the esthetician uses a um, scalpel blade and scrapes across against the hair, the way the hair grows, and can literally just peel off uh, the hair and some of the hair follicle, so it decreases growth, and it also does a really good job of um, ex um, exfoliating your face too at the one fell swoop. You do one thing and, and you get both things. Your hair goes away and you're exfoliated. So that's a good thing, but you have to have somebody who's a professional do that for you. And it takes a, um, an appointment at a spa or, um, yeah, at a spa. Laser hair removal is the most expensive removal, but it is also something that you can, um, when you do it and you do it let me rephrase this. You have to do a series because hair grows in every six weeks you get a new crop of hair. So you have to do it on an every six week basis until the hair doesn't grow out anymore. So you have to buy a package. One treatment doesn't work. So, and you have to have darker facial hair than your skin color. So if you have um, a dark tan, you can't do it. If you have white hair or light hair, it is not going to be um, removed by laser. You have to have 
lighter skin, darker hair, and then it effectively kills the hair follicle so that you are not gonna grow another hair back in that hair follicle. So that's a good way to do it. Um, that is probably the most complete and easiest for maintenance. Uh, that's the easiest way to get rid of facial hair. And it is uh, a nice way to, um, it's pretty fast and it's not a very expensive laser treatment. It's expense, more expensive than these other methods, but once you're done, you're done. So those are some things that you can do to uh, get rid of the facial hair before you, before you get your pellets or right after you get your pellets. Now when we have patients who get acne, now I get facial hair, but just genetically I've never had acne. Some other people have acne and never get facial hair. It is not the, it has to do with whether you get acne, has to do with whether you've had acne before in your life. If that's how your genetics responds to testosterone, it's all about individual people and how they respond to testosterone. But we use the same uh, spironolactone and uh, saw palmetto to prevent uh, acne, but we also, um, can use the topical estrogen solution, and we do decrease the testosterone dose and the um, increase the estrogen dose if estrogen is, is used. But acne is something that becomes infected, so you have to really clean your face. And we, benzoyl peroxide 5% wash is what we suggest to use as a face wash in the morning and at night. Um, you should scrub your face periodically using exfoliating uh, scrubs at home or exfoliating facials or masks that take the top layer of ep uh, epithelial skin off so it doesn't cover the pore and cause it to, to become infected. So that's very important. You can use acne blue light therapy where you sit in front of a blue light for 20 minutes and that helps decrease the um, bacterial count on the face and it decreases your risk of having in inflamed acne. Um, there are also prescriptions. Retin-A is a uh, cream that you can use on your face to decrease acne. You can also use um, minicin, which is a tetracycline that you can take um, throughout your body to get rid of the bacteria on your skin, but you're also getting rid of the bacteria uh, all over your body. So I, did, I suggest for that that you take a probiotic if you're going to take uh, minicin so you don't kill off the good bacteria in your intestines. Accutane is, a, is an expensive but uh, a good, uh, effective treatment that a dermatologist can take care of and, and can give you and monitor. Um, it is probably the most effective treatment, but it, it has some side effects for young people uh, in terms of fertility. And so you can't, you can't, just like on testosterone, you can't get pregnant on testosterone, you shouldn't get pregnant on Accutane either, it can cause birth defects. So, so for our patients, it's, not, it's generally not an issue, they're done with childbearing. And last but not least, use a moisturizer that is not oily, so it's an oil-free moisturizer if you need to use a moisturizer for your face. Now I'm gonna show some pictures of what hair loss from a uh, from a testosterone turned into DHT causes. So, so there, you can kind of tell what's causing hair loss if you look at the pattern of the hair loss. If the hair loss is here and down the middle, right down the middle, especially right at the crown, but the rest of the hair is still growing, then that is the type of hair loss that can be caused by testosterone and uh, DHT made from testosterone. This is, once again, it's your genetics plus testosterone. Not everybody, of course, not everybody gets this. In fact, very few people get it. But this is the way it looks in this uh, photo. Um, we call it androgenic hair loss. We have to first confirm the right diagnosis because every bit of hair shedding or hair loss is not from your testosterone. Just because you're taking testosterone, if your hair starts falling out, doesn't mean it's from that. So hair loss that's all over your head, that you're getting a lot of hair in the sink or um, in the shower when you, when you shampoo, it can be for many reasons. What the top reason is, the most common reason that I find is somebody's thyroid is low. 
So if your thyroid's low, you're gonna lose hair all over and your hair's gonna be brittle. It's gonna break off and frizz. And that's low thyroid hair loss. So that's something completely different from the testosterone. It has to be treated with thyroid and maybe iodine, depending on how severe it is. Um, so that is something that is not hair loss from your testosterone. Uh, another um, cause of hair loss that we find to be common is if you've had anesthesia in the last six months, your hair is going to fall out for six months. That's just kind of a given. So at the end of six months, everything starts coming back. Baby hairs start growing. It's just that that's the effect of anesthesia, and it's very common. And one of the things that we ask our patients about when they call and say, oh, my hair is falling out. It must be the testosterone. Well, if it's falling out all over, it's more likely to be anesthesia if you've had anesthesia in the last six months. Lots of medications cause hair loss, which you, you wouldn't know about. People don't say, oh, here's this medication. It might cause hair loss. The biggest, the biggest cause of hair loss is beta blockers, metoprolol, which is a beta blocker we use for a fast heart rate, we use it for high blood pressure, we use it for lots of different things, but that's going to make your hair fall out and all over, not just in one place. So if you have to take cortisol or, or um, a med Medrol dose pack, that can make your hair fall out. It also is going to make your testosterone less uh, effective because it increases the... Um, cortisol binding protein, which also binds up testosterone. So you have to know that before you take a, a steroid. Poor diet, if you don't have enough protein in your diet, if you're vegan but not getting enough protein, then you're not gonna grow hair. It just, it, it may fall out or it may just not grow. Um, lack of um, iron in your diet and anemia can cause your hair to fall out as well. Some vitamin deficiencies can cause your hair to fall out. So you have to make sure that your diet is very good and varied and has lots of protein in it for you to grow hair. Um, but biotin does help your hair grow, so you could take biotin, which is a B vitamin, to help your hair grow. Um, there are some people who just have genetic hair loss, like uh, the people on the, my mother's side, I mean, my everybody's hairy on my father's side, and on my mother's side, everybody's hair falls out and they look almost bald. Not everybody, but most, most of the women on my mother's side. So they were very fair and very thin hair to begin with, and then their hair just started falling out just genetically. So that is something that we have to look for when we're considering what to do with our patients who have hair loss. Um, but first, I always, before I even draw blood to see if there's any of these um, hormone-related causes, uh, or uh, nutrition deficiency related causes, I ask what the pattern of the hair loss is. Because if it's just here and here, that probably can be from testosterone. So we need to lower the testosterone level or use some of the blocking agents. Uh, maybe even finasteride, which is, a, is going to also block the good effects of testosterone. Um, but, and we don't use it for very long because it, it has lasting effects. But um, if you are losing your hair all over, that can be uh, high cortisol, it can be low thyroid, it can be anesthesia, it can be any of these other medication causes. So um, that's something that we have to consider. These are the medications that I just listed. Uh, anesthesia, steroids, beta blockers, some other blood pressure medications. PTU, which is a thyroid suppressing medication that we use when somebody has hyper hyper uh, thyroidism. Um, you all know that cancer drugs can easily cause you to lose all your hair. Autoimmune medications, some of the um, immune suppressants can cause hair loss. And Lupron drugs that put people into menopause when they're trying to get pregnant or when they have endometriosis, that medication generally makes women lose their hair because their estrogen is so low. So, uh, so that's something to be aware of if you're worrying about hair loss. Uh, when we have people with female androgenic hair loss that is diagnosed as that, and, and probably the best way to diagnose it, besides the ways I was, I was describing, is to uh, check a DHT to see if the DHT is higher than 20. And if it is, then that could be the cause. 
and then you ch and you check the free testosterone level to see if it is higher than what we want it to be with pellets. Um, we also uh, check thyroid levels, but uh, treatment for just the androgenic hair loss is going to be to decrease the pellet dose of testosterone and increase the estrogen. We also use salt palmetto. We also use spironolactone in these doses. And we there are topical prescriptions that we can use that are compounded that have some of these, the spironolactone or the salt palmetto or estrogen, and we can have you apply it to your scalp before you go to bed every night, then you wash it out in the morning. Uh, another topical answer is over-the-counter, and you can get it at any drugstore, it's minoxidil. And that does help your hair grow no matter what the cause, but that does help your hair grow. And topical estrogen compounds, you can use the same topical estrogen um, uh, prescriptions that we use on a woman's bottom that is atrophic. You can use that on your scalp as well. Voice changes. Voice changes can be for many reasons, but if someone's taking testosterone, they immediately think it's going to be from their testosterone. But um, the symptoms of voice change from, from anything would be lowering of your singing voice, cracking kind of like the inability to have just a normal voice, but you crack like somebody who's going through um, puberty. Um, but the other causes are much more common than the... the um, uh, cause of testosterone. They are uh, from reflux. When you have reflux, you know, and you feel acid in your in your esophagus, generally it's going all the way up to your vocal cords, and it can cause you to be raspy. Um, I've had that before, and it goes away when you take something for that or relieve the reason you have that. Some people have HPV virus on their um, vocal cords. It makes them raspy sounding, and if they're taking testosterone, it's usually just written off as testosterone. When the testosterone goes away, then the raspy stays because it's for a different reason. Um, but so you have to make sure that you have an ENT evaluation before you decide that this is a testosterone side effect. Um, if you've had surgery on your vocal cords or you've had a biopsy of your vocal cords, you can have scarring and that changes the pitch of your voice. Uh, you can have polyps on your vocal cords. These are all ENT issues that should be taken care of by an ear, ear, nose, and throat doctor. Vocal trauma, if you've been hit in the throat or you've had a car accident where you've had a, a, a an injury from your seatbelt can cause that. And any kind of surgery of the neck, if you've had thyroid surgery, the, the recurrent um, laryngeal nerve that goes to your vocal cords can change the pitch of your voice. All of this is diagnosed or ruled out by an ENT doctor. The specialists in pellets and pellet testosterone for women um, have done research on the allegation that testosterone causes the lowering of the voice. And they have found that in general, when they rule out everything else, they don't find that testosterone is the cause of the voice lowering. And I can tell you that in my practice, I've had a few people who said their voice were lowered, was lowered, and after much, many visits and much, much uh, coaxing, they've gone to an ENT and found that, oh yeah, they did have treatment of their vocal cords in the past, and they do have scarring from that treatment, and oh yeah, that's what it was. But they didn't really think about it or notice it until they took the testosterone because they were considering the testosterone to be the cause. So, um, doc Dr. Um, Rebecca Glazer is out of uh, University of Ohio, and she and Dimitri Kakis is a, they are both specialists in testosterone for women. And I, and their uh, research is excellent, and I gave the, gave some of the um, sources for you to read their articles, but that is, that's what my experience is with, um, with voice changes. If we find that this is the issue, we can use spironolactone, we can treat with finasteride, we can decrease the T pellet dose, we can increase the estrogen, and all of those things are going to resolve the problem while we're lowering the testosterone dose, which will then finally look, cause, uh, cause a, a resolution and a regaining of your voice. It is not irreversible. There are so many ENT doctors that have told my patients 
that this is irreversible and it is not. When your testosterone drops, your voice um, goes back to your normal voice. Okay, last but not least, the causes of weight gain are often mistakenly associated with testosterone pellets. Now, testosterone causes you to gain muscle and lose fat, but that's assuming that as you're gaining muscle, you're eating appropriately, you're exercising appropriately enough to lose fat. So if you have weight gain and you don't follow any of the suggestions that I give my patients at the very beginning of their treatment, then it's possible that you could still maintain your fat level and if you keep your bad habits and gain muscle, which will make your total weight go up. But if you are doing what you should do to be healthy and exercising regularly and eating properly, then you should lose fat and gain muscle, which means you're going to be smaller because a pound of fat is about that big. A pound of muscle is like this. It's very dense. It weighs more, but it's smaller. So you will, by gaining muscle, you'll end up burning more calories because muscle is your major organ of burning calories and you will lose fat because we use fat to burn calories. So uh, as long as we aren't eating improperly, we will be um, thinner, smaller, not bigger. So these are the causes of fat gain when you're on the pellets, obviously lack of exercise, high carb foods, um, insulin resistance. Sometimes people just already have a problem. They have insulin resistance and they can't lose weight in the normal way. Uh, low thyroid, elevated cortisol, metabolic sy syndrome, which is a pre-diabetic state with insulin resistance, or diabetes. If you are a couch potato, you are not going to lose fat because you're not moving. And a high carb processed food or fast food diet is going to make you gain muscle. You'll gain muscle from the testosterone, but you won't gain weight. You won't lose weight from the fat. So these are the lifestyle changes that we use. We increase exercise, all the things you've always heard, whole food diet, no fast foods, no simple sugars, low carb. Um, we use supplements to help uh, weight loss. We use uh, probiotics, DIM, and methyl B12. And we have in weekly injections of um, amino acids that help you lose weight called Lipo Plus. We also use some medication. Sometimes uh, we'll add Arimidex to decrease estrone levels, and that will help you lose weight. We use metformin extended release only. You don't use the short acting. You have to use extended release at least um, one, to, one to four a day, depending on your size and how much weight you have to lose. Um, in rare instances, we can use a traditional diet pill called fenteramine. And if you are uh, wealthy or have diabetes and your insurance will pay for it, we use ozempic, ribelis, or uh, semaglutide. So those are the things we can do for you if you have any of these weight gaining problems because, not because of the pellets and gaining testosterone and gaining muscle, it is because you're not losing for a different reason. Either your lifestyle is, has to be changed or you're gonna need some help with medication. So these are the problems that we troubleshoot every day with our patients. We have an RN who helps us troubleshoot. We have a, a nurse practitioners assigned to every patient who help uh, our patients get through all of this. And as long as you know that you can expect some of these issues or you may not have any at all, then I think um, forewarned is, is always better so that you know what your expectations should be. In general, my patients don't really have any problems that they consider problems because they're so happy that all of their other symptoms are gone. So. Please go ahead and try getting on pellets if you have the symptoms of low testosterone and you're miserable after age 40, and then know what the side effects can be and take care of them. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BioBalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter 
at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth.